Next, a bygone photographer who documented Jewish life in central Ohio. Mexican popsicles drive a local eatery. Then, a family on the east side has made a dynasty out of flowers. That's next, so stay tuned. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Algren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. You'll see by our stories on this episode, entrepreneurs are focused, strong-willed, and determined to succeed, much like the Germans who built their homes and businesses here in German Village. And entrepreneurs have an eye for the unusual, like Mexican popsicles, which I got to taste, and I'll share with you a little later on in the show. You should be sharing right now. Our first story is about a photographer named Herb Topolowski. You probably never heard of him, but he documented the changes he saw here in the city right after the Second World War. He made his living as a commercial photographer and documented most of Jewish life in central Ohio. My granddad came over with his parents. I believe was, he was two to three years old. It was probably 1881 or 1882. Like a lot of the immigrants, refugees at the time, they went where the work was. And Circleville, that's where they settled. They were hidesmen. They'd go around and collect uh, hides from uh, farmers. Eventually, my granddad down there was in uh, a grocery business, and then he moved up here and opened the barrel house. That was in 1917. It was at 76 West Broad Street. And on one side was a bar, and the other side was the barrels. And at that time, you'd bring your bottles in, and they would, I assume, clean them and recork them. And then prohibition came, and that pretty much ended the bar business. They moved over to uh, State Street. Uh, this was at State and Wall Alley, where the Rife Center is right now. And uh, the restaurant was called the Java Lunch Room. You could get a regular dinner, pork dressing, roast beef, brown gravy, baked ham and baked beans, potatoes, bread and butter, coffee, tea, milk, or a beer for 25 cents. When Prohibition was over, uh, the story is that Grandma, she was first in line at the Department of Liquor Control to get her liquor license back. We've always been told that her liquor license was a single digit number on it. My dad was born in 1918. Because his parents were in the restaurant business and they opened up very early and closed very late, uh, most of his uh, family involvement centered around the restaurant. So he spent most of his childhood playing downtown. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, friends that he had. There weren't a lot of kids down there. Actually, the uh, son of the fellow that uh, ran the Neal House was one of his buddies. So he was kind of taken in by all the technology that he saw around him. 35 millimeter photography, what we called candid photography, came into play and it was basically where you could take pictures uh, a lot easier than you can in the old days where you had to have the plates put in the camera and all this studio kind of thing. So, he made a, a kind of a, a, a start by taking pictures for the Macchio, uh, which was the OSU yearbook, 
uh, and he took pictures of the fraternity parties and, and this kind of thing. Later on when he graduated OSU in arts and sciences, a lot of the organizations would suddenly realize that they wanted publicity shots and dad was kind of a natural that he'd already had some interaction in that kind of a situation so he started taking publicity shots for many different kinds of organizations anything from product photography to promotions for theatrical works. Being part of the Jewish community, he was their go-to guy. So I not even try to count the weddings, the bar mitzvahs, the uh, pictures of community meetings, the bowling leagues. They always were bringing in somebody famous to do a speaker. And this was one of the pictures that I didn't even know he had taken. But that's Mrs. Roosevelt. Being in downtown Columbus, he got involved with uh, just a, every part of society. It was not unusual for Jib Rhodes to call the house on a Saturday or Sunday. And he was the only one that called him Topi rather than Toppy. So we always knew who was on the phone. He was auditor of the state at the time. And we went up to his house. He said, Herb, tomorrow I'm going to announce I'm running for governor. And my father said to him, what is the theme of the campaign going to be? And he said, looked at my dad and he says, profit is not a dirty word in Ohio. And my father looked down and said, is that your briefcase in the corner? And he said, yes. He says, pick it up and follow me outside. And we went outside in the middle of the street and he told Jim Rhodes to walk about 20 feet away from him, turn around and come at him like he meant business. And that was the picture. Again, another Sunday morning, a phone call, meet me downtown. And uh, wasn't sure where we were going, but dad followed him in his, his car and the police cars. And they went into Mount Olivet Church, I believe, on uh, East Main Street. And when they came out, dad shook his head and he says, you're not gonna believe who we just took a picture of. Rhodes found out that Martin Luther King was in town. And there's a picture of James Rhodes and Martin Luther King. Dad was the staff photographer that wasn't. And uh, a lot of the, the news media, they had limited photography staffs. So anytime there was some event, the people at the event were saying, well, who's going to show up and who isn't? We better call Herb. A little later on, this was in the early 50s, Dad carried a little, something looked like a cell phone, a little beeper. And the beep went off and Dad would go to a telephone and then he would talk to the uh, operator and they'd say, Herb, you're needed over here. So he'd literally go from one place to the other. A few years later, he put two-way radios, like police radios, in our cars. Back in the early 50s, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were a big, big deal. When they were in town, they came by airplane and the uh, sheriff at the time decided to arrest them. Of course, that was a promotion. promotion. It wasn't yeah. really and, arresting And him. so they handcuffed him, and I think they took him downtown and booked him into the Neal house. But that was the kind of crazy stuff they could do back then. Well, Dad liked to innovate a lot, and regardless of what situation he found himself in, uh, people would stop by and say, hey, I need a picture of this, I need a picture of that. So as I understand it, when uh, Wendy Thomas came in, uh, you know, they needed a, a picture. Sit down, Wendy, and they just ran through a, a bunch of uh, just candid shots. And there was good smiles, bad smiles. They were just looking for a, a quick, good little picture that they can build a logo from. The story is, is that Dad found some pipe cleaners to put in her pigtails to hold the pigtails where they needed to be. And this is the original photograph. when we closed the business in 2005. And I know there's at least 350,000 negatives and they're stored in the order they were taken. So if we wanted to know what dad was doing 50 years ago today, within a couple of days, we could go back into that collection and show you that he may have been taking pictures of paint cans in the morning and celebrities in the afternoon and a car accident somewhere in between. We would walk down High Street, and as we were walking down the High Street, it was, hi Herb, hi Herb. Dad was welcomed and accepted in all different kinds of religious organizations. He was trusted. His ethics were unbelievably uh, unselfish. 
And uh, if there was one thing that uh, I can take away from uh, that experience is I learned how to treat people. Next, a Mexican restaurant with a sweet appeal. Then, a family on the east side has made a dynasty out of flowers. So, what's the difference between a Mexican popsicle and the ones you get in the grocery store? I'll tell you, Charlene, it's real fruit, both whole and pureed. It's a summer favorite all year round. It's a simple recipe with a whole lot of love. So, check it out. Tucked away in a little shopping center at the corner of Sawmill and Bethel Road is the original location for Diamond's Ice Cream Parlor. As you enter the shop, you are met with a festive display of colors, aromas, and flavors. There is an endless number of frozen treats to choose from, including their breakout star, the Mexican Paleta. These gourmet popsicles are made in-house with real fruit and include flavors like kiwi strawberry, cactus pear, jalapeno, and mango chili. Today I'm meeting with partners Renee, Jose, and Fabian to get the inside scoop. We're at Diamond's Ice Cream Parlor, famous Diamond's Ice Cream Parlor. What do we have here and uh, who do we have to thank for this amazing ice cream set? Like what, the paletas, what, I got the blackberry uh, cream. Uh, what are y'all having? I'm having the mango chamoy. I have a kiwi and a strawberry. I have like a coconut. Coconut. Now, who comes up with the ideas for the flavors? All, all three of us. Um, or our customers, they just, they just come in and they um, say, uh, do you have this specific flavor? And um, if we don't have it, we just go ahead and try to make it. What's the best idea you've gotten from a customer? This is, is a great idea. For yeah, me. yeah. Because that, that flavor we don't have in, in, in Mexico. Uh -huh. And when we come in here, you know, when we open here, the Clara customer, he say, you have kiwi and strawberry. Uh -huh. And we make a special for the customers. And where'd you get the idea to even start a ice, ice cream parlor? The idea is coming from my family in Mexico. And my nephew, he have a business in Guadalajara. Mm -hmm. and, and for seven years. And when I go to Mexico, my son, he liked the idea for the ice creams. And Rene, he worked for me in another location, and, and he and he told me he he can partner to me. Okay. And we put and, and this idea to everybody to open here in Columbus. And you have locations here and here Hillier, we are and Linworth. And, and Linworth. Yeah. What have been some of the struggles or challenges that you've experienced? It really hasn't been a struggle. People loved it since yeah, yeah. we started. It's always been um, a struggle, like trying to. Um, have new ideas, coming up with new ideas daily, because we love to like offer new things every day. We have to do what like uh, whatever the customer asks for us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like uh, what they say, sometimes we don't have a flavor, and then people come in and say, "Hey, why don't you guys make this?" So we say, "Oh, we don't have it right now, but next time when you come, yeah, I'm pretty sure like we made it for you guys." Okay. So sometimes we don't come with ideas, but customer help a lot. Wow. So you had the idea to start Diamond's Ice Cream Parlor, and you brought Renee in. How did you for form that partnership? I started working with him at, because he had too many restaurants. <laughs> so he gave me the opportunity to work with him at Vaqueros. Uh -huh. And after that, he told me like he had a very good project, and he invited me if he wanted to be part of his, or to be partner with him. Yeah, but I mean, like, uh, the idea coming from his nephew, uh -huh. because his nephew had like a good business in Mexico too. So his nephew brought all the ideas and then 
They said, well, let's do it here too. Let, there's going to be like a new project for everybody. A new opportunity. So he gave me the opportunity to be part of the partner. So we tried to do a very good team and then we're here. Yeah, and then Fabian, you're like the next generation uh, coming up. What is what what got you excited about being a part of, of this opportunity? Well, I was like um, I was a sophomore in high school. I would um, finish school and come here like at six, work mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, I liked working here. I've always thought about life as um, doing what you want to do, so it can make you happy. Uh -huh. I kind of well, I did enjoy this so um, I, I started working real hard I didn't really know what I wanted to do in college so I just decided to keep working here okay and um, we opened in Hilliard so I decided to go um, and work there by myself with okay. uh, so you pretty much run the Hilliard yeah uh, Hilliard store awesome. awesome now how does that uh, make you feel uh, to see your son get so excited about uh, being uh, in the ice cream business with you I'm very happy, you know, like, yeah, yeah. he's my son. Yeah, yeah. And because he, when we were in Mexico, he, he told me, hey, daddy, I, I, because I have restaurant business, and he told me, I don't like restaurant business. He said, I, I, I like something different. And I told you, why, why do you like it? And when we go to Mexico, he told me he liked the ice cream business. Uh -huh. Okay, let me try. Is, is that important to you to celebrate uh, Mexican culture or promote Mexican culture through, through uh, the food that you serve? And why, and why so? Yes, because um, there's things that um, people really don't get to try because they don't travel as much or they never get to get down there. So we like to um, bring new ideas back here. All right. So if they can't get to Mexico, we bring Mexico to them. To Columbus. Through, to Columbus through the paletas. Yeah. All right. And, and, and we got the corn. Who, who, who's, whose idea is this and who do we have to thank for this? That's a traditional in Mexico. People started asking if we sold it and then we just Added it to the menu. Yeah. You want it? You got it. You got it. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, it's more than buying ice cream and, and corn. You're buying an experience. You're having an experience when you come to Diamonds, a family experience, and you're it's making a, a friend. It's a big experience for everybody, you know, because when we open here, American, Spanish, Indian, everybody coming to try the paletas and water. And really surprised, you know, <coughs> I'm surprised because I worked for 25 years in Mexican restaurant. It's coming a lot of America, a lot of Spanish people, but a lot of, a lot of you know, like Chinese people or Indian people not coming much to Mexican restaurant. Uh -huh. In this location, everybody, every, the, the whole world is coming here. Awesome, awesome. I'm very surprised. So you have as many different uh, flavors of ice cream you have, you have different flavors of people coming in. Yeah, I yeah, love it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah you're right. How many flavors of paletas do you have right now? 68. Well, until I get to all 68 flavors uh, of uh, the paletas, uh, let's at least uh, get into this amazing corn. I'm gonna set this aside for the moment because I think we should try this corn before it gets too cold. So thank you all so much for uh, sharing your love, sharing your family, and sharing, sharing your amazing food with us. I really appreciate it. Craft beer is big in Columbus. Ever wonder how we ranked alongside big brewing cities like Portland? Find out about that story and more at Curious Sea Bus, where you submit a question online, and if voters agree, we report the story together. Look for stories, submit a question, or log on for a voting round at wsu.org slash curious. Handing down a business to the next generation has got to be satisfying. I mean, a life's work lives on, you know? Absolutely, and that next generation has a lot riding on their shoulders. We visited Batiste Flower Shop on the east side where expectations run high. Our grandmother started this flower shop 75 years ago in rural South Carolina on Long Street. 
So it's quite interesting that it would become full circle. Here we are on Long Street in Columbus, Ohio. We have always had the flower shop. My mother has always had the flower shop. We had just at one point gone off to do our individual careers only to come back to our first love, which was the flower shop. Uh, we sat down and had a long conversation and say, well, you know, this is what we do. Uh, this is what we know. We've grown up in the business. All of us have grown up in the business. We've got all of our resources in place. Resources meaning all of our vendors. Um, and in fact, some of the same vendors that we used in South Carolina for as long as I've been in the business 48 plus years ago, um, we're still using some of those same vendors. Shana would deliver flowers for me every Sunday morning. She had passed through this bill for 15 years and hadn't seen this bill. And then one morning she was delivering flowers. She looked up and saw the bill and she said, where in the world that bill didn't come from? And the bill had been here 100 years, <laughs> you know. So she came home and she said, Mom, she said, you know what? I think I find our building. She said, I'm going to find out who, who, who owned the building and I'm going to take you to see it. When I saw it, I said, ain't no way in the world. <laughs> she wouldn't come past the door. She I stood said, to the door and we came in with the owner of the building. She said, no, I'm okay. I'll stand right here. Spider met me <laughs> coming down in the doorway. <laughs> she said, absolutely not. I'm, you go ahead. <laughs> I said, ain't no way. And Shana said, well, well, I see the potentials. I said, okay. <laughs> you, you showed me. It was really, it was truly a mess. Uh, the floors were pitted. There was uh, mold up the wall. There was water leaks. It had, you had to have a vision in order to see where it could possibly be. And um, lo and behold, it took us two and a half years to do the renovations. We didn't ask for a loan or a grant. Everything that we have funded, we're thankful to God that it's been a cash-based business. That's one of the things that both sets of grandparents taught us. They paid cash for their houses and their cars and um, the kids' education even at that time. And I kind of figured when we sat down and talked, if there's probability in what they're, they're saying to, to operate on a cash-based business, there's got to be some, some wisdom in that. We've been fortunate where the money that we're making, we're turning in the business. The Tis LaFleur Galleria is not just a regular flower shop. We are a gallery of art from a floral perspective. So each piece kind of morphs into a, a piece of artwork. Someone told me, she said, a girlfriend of mine got one of your arrangements and I looked at it and I knew that it came from your shop. So it's a, it's a part about trying to stay true and grow that brand. One of the things that we've been very, very, very keen to is just whoever it is, just kind of understand what their personality is and pulling that in and pulling textures of flowers that will speak to that particular personality. And one of the things that we have also asked, um, what's your budget? What do you want to spend today? And we've got one of our neighbors um, and she will come in and spend $3 every week on something different, something pretty just for her bedside. And then we have customers that will say, Sean, you know, only have 20. Absolutely, we're gonna fit whatever that budget is and make it beautiful. So it's, it's a combination of not running a business on a regular cookie cutter type situation. So we've kind of stayed away from that and making every design that's super distinctive. I knew they were gonna do it at some point. It makes me feel real, really proud of them. And you know, I knew they was gonna do it at some point because I think maybe they're just, just, they're just like I am. They believe in working for, you know, themselves and, and carrying the legacy on. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Got a rose and a letter, open it in the dark. Message from the one I love, got inside of me. Sleep at night
thinking about fortune. Rose and a pattern whisper into my bones. Must be some kind of voodoo who could make my love stay. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortine Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.